morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 81, verses 1 and 2. The psalmist writes, Sing aloud to to the God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with a harp. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come to sing of your strength. The give confession that you are God who provides and meets the need of our lives. And that you are a God who is worthy of worship. Father, as we gather in your presence, we invite your presence to be with us. May all that we do be a pleasing aroma to you as we offer up our worship through song and through spoken and proclaimed word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you to stand as we begin our, our continue our service in him. Good morning. Our first hymn this morning is Christ has made the sure foundation. difficulties with our words, but you can find the words on our website, http colon backslash backslash www.fortleavenworthchapel.org, and you can uh, sing along with us there. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, welcome this morning. It is good to see each one here as our, I say our crowds, our crowds continue to expand and, uh, and more and more people are able to return back and, and worship with you. It's good to see each one here, as well as having those who are watching online to be with us. And uh, as we work through also some a few technical difficulties as we get all our, our uh, announcement slides and words that are uploaded as, as we need to, as well as again, as Kathy mentioned, knowing that they're online. Hey, a couple of announcements of things that have, I say, changed or are new updates to announcements. Uh, we now have four uh, Sunday school classes that are offered in the morning, two on Zoom and two live and in person. Uh, one, as uh, Dr. Kim's class, Jack Kim has just started and, uh, in Romans. His is one of the Zoom classes and, uh, and look online and you know, all for the, uh, I say for the bulletins, for the announcements where, where the Zoom number is and, uh, that is located on there that, uh, that is available to know where to tune into that class. Then Dr. Nowiski uh, begins a, a study called A Fragile Stone, 
uh, is a study uh, in the life of Peter and Jesus and their relationship. And, uh, so that begins as well. So keep that in mind. As well as our very own chaplain, Jeff Smith, will begin his class in The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller. Uh, and that's one of the live classes. So that'll be right in the activity room here following the service. And, uh, and then Randy Klinger is starting a class up in front here in room 150. And, uh, where he'll be, they'll be getting a study through First and Second Corinthians, and so that one's up in front here in room 150 live. And all those classes start at 9:45. So as we finish our service and, uh, at 9:30, then we can transition over to that, and which also means that Chaplain Smith and I have to make sure that we end the service at 9:30 to give you time to transition as we begin our live classes and our online classes uh, as well. So be aware of that. Also, you'll see it as the slides go by. The, uh, the, the youth ministry is beginning to pick back up again, and, uh, and, and the Zoom pages and times and locations are on that, as Keith Purvis and, uh, is helping lead out that, and uh, as we get that going again for our junior high and high school folks. And, and Keith, if I say anything wrong, just jump up and say, hey, Chapman, ain't right. <laughs> I don't. All right, thank you. And uh, so that is beginning and taking off as well, so just be aware of that. And again, for our ladies, PwC is off and running, and uh, their classes are, are online in, in a Zoom room as well. But that information is uh, is on the slides as well. We're to tune in for that, and and as we get more things up and going, and as we have childcare up and going, we'll be able to do more and more live and in person as we're able to take care of the kids and uh, during that. And with that, you see in the slides for for online giving and giving course here in person in our basket, you know, in the back, you know, we ask you to, to be a part and to participate in that. But again, stay tuned for for whether it's on the Facebook page and uh, Fort Leavenworth. Yeah, the, the chapel there on, on the Facebook page and then the .org you know, website page. All the announcements are listed there and you're able to download everything that's happened and stay in tune you know, with what's happening here at Fort Leavenworth and our Protestant chapel community and, uh, and to be a part of that. And again, welcome. We are so glad that you're here and uh, participating with us. And with that, let me turn it back over and invite you to stand again as we continue in song. Our next hymn is the church's one foundation.
we come to our affirmation of faith, you know, the words are, are behind me and in front of me, actually, as we join together. But with that, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And with that, you may be seated. As we come to our time of, of pastoral prayer, and uh, remember to keep our, our outreach and our efforts and our in, in your prayer as, as, go, as they uh, learn how to speak, as days go forward, and as we continue to go forward, continue to keep that, as we look for, for ways to reach out to our community and, uh, and to let them know of the great things happening here and on Fort Leavenworth and the Protestant Chapel, and particularly in the 830 traditional service. And also be in prayer for that. And uh, we have uh, a couple of folks this week who are, who are going to doctor's appointments and, uh, and, and continuing some of their, their treatments and uh, some of their updates. And, uh, and so keep them in your prayers. And uh, it, it just for, for privacy's sake, we want to protect them a little bit so we're not calling out names. But, uh, but know and, uh, that we have some folks who are seeing the doctor this week. And, uh, and to keep them in your prayers. God knows who they are. I uh, ask you as well, as we, we continue to go through, uh, the, for our folks who are living out west, a little further west than we are, as fire season continues throughout California and other part of our western states, keep our firefighters in your prayers in those communities that are impacted by that. Along with, and I ask you that to keep in your prayers our nation's cities as we continue to see the news unfold and the turmoil that is taking place there in our cities. And as we just finished the book of Jonah, and uh, we realized God's concern for the great cities of the world. And I has recorded there, as he told Jonah to go to Nineveh, so I encourage you to keep those in your prayers as well. And again, I remind you, uh, as you have prayer requests, one, you know, as, as Chaplain Smith and I or Kathy are here on Sunday morning, feel free to come up to us and say, hey, can we add this? We'll be glad to do that. Or again, submit through the Facebook page or the website those requests and, uh, as, as we go forward in the days that you would have us to be praying for as well. And uh, so with that, let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace that is new and afresh every day and every morning. Father, your word invites us to come and make our requests known to you. So Father, we, we pray for each other. Lord, there are many of us who are going through just normal routine medical treatments and updates in an ongoing basis. And so Father, we remember our members who are going through that this week. And uh, if for, I say for different uh, treatments, some are just recovering post-surgery, others are ongoing cancer treatments. Lord, you know the needs in that. It, as the psalmist says in 139, we are divinely created by you. You knew us even before you know, we were born, while we were being knitted together in our mother's womb. You knew who we are. So you know how we function and how our bodies are made. So Lord, we pray for that. We pray for the physical need, but Lord, we remember as well that there's a spiritual reality and need taking place underneath that, that we may need to, to grow in our maturity in Christ and closer to you, but also recognize your grace is present in all those situations. Father, with that, we pray for the outreach of our chapel communities, particularly our 830 service here, as we look for ways to reach out to the community and let them know that, that we are here, that services are happening, and there's opportunities for them and their families to come and worship, participate in religious education, and in all the activities of the chapel that are going on right now. So, Father, as we reach out to the Fort Leavenworth community, give us insight and wisdom, and uh, we ask for success in our efforts as we do that. Father, as we are, we are citizens both of our nation and both citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Father, we do pray for our nations across the country. Lord, there is, there is turmoil and unrest. There is violence and, uh, and evil that has taken place. So, Father, we pray for our major cities, that you be at work in there, that the church and your representative, we are reminded that there is always a remnant there, is able to have an influence and a witness for you in the midst of that. And as folks, you know, eyes will be open and see the reality of who you are and your grace is present even in the midst of that. 
But Father, we lift up our cities. Even when words fall short of how to pray, we ask that your will be done in the midst of all those situations. And it's happening there with leadership, with the, with the first responders, police force and firemen as they are working there. Lord, be with them in a unique way. Lord, as well as it is the, the coming to that dry end of the summer in a lot of our, our cities and, and towns are experiencing fires out in the West. Lord, be with them. Protect our firefighters as they put their lives on the line and uh, to help fight those fires and protect the communities around them. So Lord, we lift them up as well. Father, as we come, as a prayer of the people of God, draw us ever closer to you. Help us see not only with our physical eyes, but with our spiritual eyes and the reality that's that happening around us. That we may pray with a greater precision and with a greater clarity, asking for your will be done in situations. That your grace be demonstrated through things that sometimes seem like they're completely without grace. For your word reminds us you can take that which was intended for evil and turn it for your good. So, Father, we pray that that it truly is the reality, leaning and trusting on the promises that you've given us, that that is the reality. As we pray for our nation, we pray for each other, and uh, as we go forward, Lord, trusting you with our prayers. And, Lord, thank you that we have this avenue of grace to come into your presence and pray. Not only do we do it individually and as families at home, but, Father, the opportunity to gather as the body of Christ to pray. And, Lord, with that, let us unite ourselves together in the Lord's Prayer as we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And with that, we'll have our scripture reading. Good morning. Today's uh, scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 4 through 14. Hebrews 1, 4 through 14. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word, please? So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which, the, to which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Thank you, dear brother. What a joy it is to see each of you here this morning. I think that might just kicked off, but I'm sure it will kick back on. So uh, we have this mic here, so Lord willing, those of you who are online are still able to, uh, to hear us. Uh, but what a joy it is to uh, see you here with us this morning. And, uh, and again, let me just take advantage of this moment to remind those of you who are watching online that there's still room for you. 
I want you to know that because in the back of the mind, there are, there are those who are wondering, yeah, but is there really room for us? I just want you to know, yes, there, there's room. It's awesome that we're seeing more people come to the service. It's much better than, uh, sir, if you remember back on day one when it was just a few of us and it was all empty, but there is still room for you. And so we encourage you as the Lord leads to come and worship with us uh, in person. Uh, before we look at our text today, let me just remind you uh, about um, something that Chaplain Jeffries had mentioned, and that was our outreach. Um, we are actually at set a date for a very special opportunity. That's the 19th of, uh, of this month, 19th of September. And what we're doing is we're, we're just going to the PX. We've been given permission to go to the PX. We'll have a little table there from 9 to 12. And as people come in, we, we just want to show them the love of Christ. And so we'll, we have uh, our little cups that some of you have received for Mother's Day and Father's Day. And uh, we'll have some goodies in there. And we'll have information about our service and chapel programs. And it will just be an opportunity to welcome people and then look for that opportunity to talk with them about the gospel. And so I would encourage you to, to see how God would have you to be a part of that ministry. Certainly there is room for those extroverts who just don't know a stranger for you to be there with that warm, friendly smile, welcoming them and talking to people. But we also have room for those introverts or those who might consider themselves introverts and our prayer warriors as well. Because all that we do and aim to do would be just a human effort if the Spirit of God is not at work in this ministry, opening up the eyes of people and drawing them to himself. And so I encourage you, how can you be involved? One, you can just let me know. Again, that's going to be the 19th from 9 to 12. And, but then also we're going to have a day of training. So on the 17th at Frontier Chapel, that's the big chapel up here on the hill, uh, we're just going to simply talk about our game plan for that morning. But more importantly, we're going to talk about how to share the gospel, right? Because we want to welcome people. We want to love people. But we're also looking for that God-given opportunity to be able to share the gospel. And so we're going to talk about a specific way about how we can do that. And uh, that will take place on the 17th Frontier Chapel at 1730. We'll only take about an hour uh, to look over uh, our plan and then talk about a, a specific technique of sharing and uh, if you are interested, again, please, uh, you don't have to let me know on that. Just come, participate. But certainly we would like to know if you want to show up on the 19th. That way we can use those who come to the best of our ability. Well, our word has been read for us. So if you will allow me, uh, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing over this time. Father, we do look to you from where our hope comes from. Certainly, this is a, a very enriching text. And uh, as it is for all of us, the more we study your word, there is just so much there. Yet we are indeed constrained by time. And so, Lord, we pray that you would illuminate our understanding, that you would guide us into the knowledge of truth, Lord, that you would be honored here today and that you would be exalted. We ask, Father, that you would do this as we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. So those of you who have been with us for the last few weeks know that we have begun our study in the book of Hebrews and what we're titling Better. Right? Because Jesus is better. He's better than any spokesman that has ever come before. He is better than any work that has ever been accomplished before. And he inaugurates a better way for us to know the Father and live for his glory and honor. And so we talked about really those three dynamics uh, that really covers the whole book of Hebrews. The better one and helping us to understand Christology, who is Jesus the better work as we talk about the new covenant and what that is and 
why that is so important. And then we talked about the better way, and that is that we are to live by faith. And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And so just to give you an idea, just as we talked in our introduction, that is our direction. And last week we focused Right at the beginning of our study in Christology about Jesus being the better one and seeing how he is the better spokesman. He is the better spokesman revealing to us God and his glory than any of the other prophets that have come before. And remember we talked about uh, that truth in light of how God, Jesus, is revealed in the scripture. Uh, not only in the text that we looked at in verses 1 to 3. But throughout the New Testament, in Jesus being both prophet, priest, and king. And so this morning we have this transition from his argument that Jesus has now seated. The work is done. He is now at the right hand of the Father. And the scriptures transition from that and saying that he has been given a better name. And we have this comparison that begins with Jesus and the angels. Jesus and the angels. You know, without a doubt, there is a fascination with angels today. Just in my uh, careful search, it didn't take much, just a simple Google search. Uh, anything that you want to know about angels, you can find uh, just by simply Googling it. Now, it may not be biblical, but there is a lot of information out there about angels. And without a doubt, there is this fascination, there is this, um, this desire, this curiosity about angels. We, we see them in uh, series and shows and movies. They adorn greeting cards. And they're cute little structures to collect. Maybe some of you have them. It's, it's easy to go to a thrift store or a gift shop and, and see multitude of little angels that are there. And though there is this fascination with angels, our fascination with them don't necessarily always follow a biblical understanding of who or what angels are. I mean, you don't really have to look much beyond the resurrection story when we read there that after seeing the angel, how did the people respond? How did the guards respond? Well, the Bible tells us they shook with fear. They were as dead men. It's amazing. It's a different picture than the little fat, chubby angels that we might have on the shelf somewhere. There is this fascination, and yet this fascination can lead us to a more unbiblical understanding of angels, but not just an unbiblical understanding, but an unbiblical approach to angels as well. To where not only do we acknowledge them, we tend to adore them you know, we again we're fascinated with them we want to know more about them and anytime we see something we've got to collect and again don't don't read into what i'm saying there's nothing wrong with the idea of collecting but i'm trying to paint a picture of how we can tend to elevate angels in the redemptive story of god more so than what is intended Certainly that is the case of the original authors, I'm sorry, the original uh, audience, the original recipients of the letter of Hebrews. As I mentioned a while back, these uh, people had come to themselves to elevate the angels. They admired the power. They, they admired their work in bringing the word of God. They saw them as mediators of the covenant because of the work that they did as the ministers and it led them to elevate the angels more than they should that's the reason why the apostle paul makes mentions of this in the book of galatians 
where some were even worshiping angels. Now, we may not worship angels as followers of Christ, but we have to be careful because just like any other thing in life that we idolize, we do place them in a greater significance than what we should, and we have to be careful of that. So how are we to understand angels and their depiction and their role in the redemptive plan of God? Well, again, this is what our text answers. In a nutshell, what I want you to see is that angels are not to be adored. Jesus is. We can acknowledge them. We can recognize them. We can admire them. We can be fascinated by them, but they are not to be adored. Jesus is. Jesus alone is the one that's worthy of our worship, worthy, worthy of our adoration, worthy of our praise. And you and I need to be careful of what we elevate in our lives that we ourselves are not adoring something more than Jesus. And maybe you're listening to me and you say, hey, chaplain, you don't have to worry about me. I adore Christ and Christ alone. But we have to be careful as well as what those around us might think. The things that we talk about the most, the things that we display the most, says a lot about what we believe. What I want you to get from this text as we unfold it is that certainly angels have their place in the redemptive plan of God, but they are not to be adored. Jesus is. As we look at our text, we see this comparison of Jesus and the angels. It starts off with a question and a statement in the first few verses. And then you have a, a 13 sentence, if you will, a 13 a word description or a phrase, if you will, about Jesus and his elevation above the angels. And then we conclude in verses 13 and 14 with another question and another statement that is there to cause us to ponder and think deeply. And what I want us to do this morning is that we're going to look at these three reasons why Jesus is better than the angels all to the end, all to the end, that we are careful of how we live our lives, that we adore Jesus and Jesus only. Notice, first of all here, that Jesus is depicted as being better than the angels, for he is declared to be the Son. He is declared to be the Son. Look with me once again as we go back to verse 4. Having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. How many of you understand that names today don't have the same value, the same significance as names in the biblical context? Names meant something. To us, nowadays, it's a title. You know, it's maybe the title of a doctor. Maybe it's a title of, of a rank. And, and that says a lot about who you are and what you are to do. But in the biblical context, that was the meaning of the name. The name spoke. And that's why there's so much to be made of the name of Jesus, the one who saves the one who saves and so that's the argument that he begins here in verse 4 that Jesus has been exalted in verse 3 having this greater name having this greater name than that is for the angels and what is this name well I believe that the name that he is referring to is is really the work of Christ, the accomplishment of Christ that he's going to talk about here in the next 10 verses. And there are some, though, who seem to focus primarily on what is said here in verses 5 
and 6. And that is the idea of the Son. And certainly that is a huge part of what is being described here. The name he has inherited is much more excellent. Notice what he says in verse 8 as he begins to talk about the Son. Verse 5, I'm sorry. Verse 5a. You are my Son. And I will be to him a father. You are my son. And the second part, I will be to him a father. Two quotes here. One from Psalm 2, the other of 2 Samuel. Both emphasizing the messianic sonship of Jesus. And when he makes this statement here, he is simply saying that no angel has ever been called or declared the Son of God. Now they are referred to as sons of God. You see that in the scripture. The nation of Israel is referred to as the sons of God. We, the followers of Christ in the New Testament, are referred to as sons of God. But nowhere in the scripture is anyone else declared or referred to as the Son of God than Jesus himself. MacArthur says that no single angel had ever been called a Son of God. As with Christians, angels collectively are called sons of God or children of God in the sense that God created them and that in some ways they reflect him. But the argument that the author of Hebrews is making here is that they may be collectively called the sons of God, but they are nowhere near being declared the son. There is but one. And notice how it is described here again in verse 5. I have begotten you. This is a poetic expression reflecting this relationship of the incarnate Son of God. Although Jesus was certainly the pre existent one, the pre existent Son, the eternal one, there is certainly a new dimension of the relationship that Jesus earns being the incarnated Son of God and being the obedient Son of God to the point of death and then being the exalted Son of God. And so eternally, he's always been the son, but the author here is pointing out the description that Jesus is uniquely declared the son of God. Uniquely declared the son of God. Notice the Bible goes on to tell us, having become, in verse 4, having this name superior Verse 5, for which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father. Again, illuminating the idea of sonship. And then verse 6, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. The firstborn is an indicator of a title of honor. It's a position of preeminence. It is indicating the priority of rank. This is speaking not just of a declared son, but of the son who is worthy of worship. Angels, the author is communicating to us, are to worship him. What's interesting here is that in the original context of Deuteronomy, as it is quoted the statement is referencing God, the Father. It is referencing Yahweh, the one who delivered or would deliver the nation of Israel. And yet here the author is applying it to Jesus. I like how MacArthur sums up. He says the angels did always worship Christ because again he was the eternal one, the pre-incarnate one. So they had always worshipped him at all times because of his existence. But now they worship him 
as the Son of God. They worship him as Son in his incarnate character. Of which Al Mohler says this, the argument is clear, the angels worship Christ. It is not Christ who worships the angels. The angels declare the birth of Christ. It is not Christ who declares the ministry of angels. The angels are not called sons, but that is the very name that Christ himself, the Davidic Messiah, has inherited. What is he saying here? That Jesus is better than the angels because he and he alone is declared the Son of God. The Son of God. But he's also better than the angels, for he is the eternal king. He is the eternal king. Notice what it says here in verses 7 to 12. Here we have the longer section, and this section speaks of the kingship of Jesus, and it speaks of his role as creator. Both of these, again, highlighting the uniqueness of Jesus far beyond the angels. Again, he says in verse 7, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But notice the conjunction, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He's speaking of that which is eternal, he is speaking of a throne. He is speaking of a kingdom. He is speaking of divinity. Jesus as God incarnate. And then in verse 9, he speaks of how he has loved righteousness and how this is depicting of his throne. And he's been anointed with the oil of gladness. And then notice in verse 10, as he goes from the idea of understanding the role as king to the role of creator. And you, Lord, you have laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They, the work of your hands, the, 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 the heavens, the earth that has been created, the creation will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Your years will have no end. And so the idea is, the statement that he makes about the angels is that they are made. They are created, and they are created for a purpose. He says in verse 7 that they, he makes them winds and flames of fire. The idea here is that at times the angels are appeared and appear in such a way as to bring about the purpose and the plan of God. And you've seen that throughout the scriptures where they do just that. But they are relegated to the created order. But Jesus is the creator. This is a quote from Psalm 45. Angels participate in the implementation of God's will and are considered companions. But Jesus is the sovereign king. Angels may surround the throne of God, as Al Mohler points out, but Jesus is the one who sits on the throne. He's the eternal creator. The creation will perish but the Son, on the other hand, is eternal. He will remain. He is permanent. That which has created will change. It is subject to change. It will decay. It will not last forever. But Jesus will. Jesus will. Whereas the creator order is subject to change, decay, and ultimate destruction, the person of Christ is unending and unchanging point that he's making here is that Jesus is not only better than the angels because of the name that has been declared but because of the rule the eternality of his kingdom he is God incarnate and he rules he is creator and not part of the creation 
But thirdly, he says this, Jesus is better than the angels, for he alone is the exalted son. So Jesus has been declared the son. He reigns as the son. And he is also the exalted son. And this is his argument in verses 13 and 14, which really serves as a summary of what he is saying here. He says, this to which the angels, with, has he ever said, sit at my right hand. Again, he's going back to verse 3, where he had made that previous statement of Jesus now at the right hand of the majesty of the Father on high. So in verse 3, we are told that he is there. Verse 13, we are given more information and we are told here that he is there by the invitation of the Father. He has been exalted by the Father. He is the exalted Son, which means that he has the authority and he has the rule. But notice what it says about the angels. They are but ministering spirits sent to serve and serve who those who inherit salvation jesus accomplishes salvation the angels come to minister to those who inherit that salvation it's amazing when you look at the scriptures certainly our understanding of angels are seen in a variety of ways. We see them in great glory and how people fall as dead men. We, we see them as bringing the word in very powerful ways, bringing us the news of the birth of the Messiah. And yet, the point of their existence, the author is reminding us, as they are there to but serve the same, to strengthen them in the work and the walk of the Gospels. One commentator says this, angels are spirits that minister to the body of Christ and are thus sent out by Christ himself. Angels are indeed remarkable, but they pale in comparison to the glory of the Redeemer, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he is superior to every angel, indeed, to the entire angelic host. In this passage of Scripture, what the author is doing for us is creating this comparison of Jesus and the angels. And he has done so because of this tendency, certainly of those within the original audience, to elevate the angels as something to be adored, something to be elevated, perhaps at times more so than the person and the work of Jesus. And the author is simply reminding us that the angels, we might acknowledge them. The angels, we will recognize them, but we do not adore them. Jesus and Jesus alone is the one that we are to adore. He is the one that is worthy of our worship. He is the one that is worthy of all glory. You know, certainly without a doubt, there is a fascination with angels. And we could go in a long discourse into the biblical understanding of what angels are and what they do and how they reveal themselves. The whole point of Scripture is that angels are but servants to the saved. And as just servants to the saved, they are not to be elevated. Only Christ is to be elevated. And the call, the reminder, the encouragement for all of us is that we are careful in God's redemptive plan, we are careful to acknowledge whom God uses. But we are careful also to remember that we adore only Christ. For he is worthy of our adoration. He is declared the Son by the Father. He is enthroned King. And he is exalted 
Lord by the Father. So let me ask you this as we look at closing our sermon. With such a fascination with angels that is in our culture and perhaps in our life, a desire to know, how are we to respond to this knowledge of truth? Here's what I would encourage you. Wouldn't it be great if we could be a community of believers to where without a shadow of a doubt, people know that to whom is exalted in our lives is Christ alone. By what they hear us say, by what they observe in our homes, by what they observe in our practices and our lives, they are able to see and know and identify that nothing else is exalted above and beyond the person and the work of Jesus. May God give us the grace and the strength to do just that. Fathers, we look to you. We are certainly grateful for your word and a reminder of who our Lord is. The declared Son, honored and exalted because of his incarnation, the obedience to death and the resurrection. God, we pray that you would set watch over our hearts, over our lives, and help us, O oh God, to live in such a way that what we depict to others as what we value what we elevate would be none other than Jesus alone. Help us to adore him and him alone. And I ask, oh God, that you would do this as I look to you and ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. How fitting it is for us as we wrap up our time in worship and partaking of the Lord's Supper together. I emphasize that this is the Lord's Supper. It's not the 8.30 traditional service supper. It's not Chaplain Smith's or Chaplain Jeffrey's supper. It is the Lord's Supper. And so as you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and sa Savior, we welcome you to worship him together with us as we remind ourselves of what he has done. The Bible tells us in the night in which Jesus was betrayed that he took some bread and this bread was a symbol of his body, a body that was broken and bruised for us. And then he also took a cup and he called it the cup of the new covenant. And this is what we'll talk more about later, the new covenant in his blood. And these are symbols that remind us of what Jesus has done for us. And so as we prepare to take this supper together, I would ask that you prepare your hearts to receive it and prepare your hearts to worship him in light of what he has done for us. Please take a moment and prepare your hearts to do just that. In the night of which Jesus betrayed, he took this bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and says, take eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us worship. The scriptures remind us that in the same way he took the cup, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me encourage you to stand as we close out our time of worship in song. Our closing hymn is The Bond of Love.
close out in prayer and offer the benediction, uh, let me just remind you of the opportunities that are available for all of us to continue on in our discipleship. And so two of those, no, there are no classes today because of, uh, there is one class. Okay, so there is a class. Uh, and if you have not found your place to get involved as a family, I encourage you to consider that. There is one today. The others will start again next week. Receive the benediction. Father, we look to you and so grateful for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, in this world, you tell us that we will have trouble. But take courage, for you have overcome the world. Help us, O oh Father, to take courage. Every time we go out these doors, we are overwhelmed by the thoughts and the concerns of this world. And it is so easy to cherish the things that are here, the things that are fading, the things that are decaying. Help us, O oh God, in your grace to value and treasure the things that last for eternity. And help us, O oh God, to adore you as we should. For we ask, Father, that you would do this as we look to you now in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you.